words cannot adequately describe the horror. 583 people died, the worst air disaster in history. It was all over in seconds. For the handful that lived, they would be the longest and most terrible seconds in their lives. At first, I thought they had gotten to us the bomb. The only thing I could liken it to is, is, is if each molecule of air exploded. I looked in the cabin and everything was on fire. I thought, oh my God, we're trapped. We had 28 people in the upstairs lounge. The lounge was no longer on the airplane. Joan was standing there yelling, Suzanne, take my hand. The engines were starting to disintegrate. I lost Joan's hand very quickly. I had my, put my hands over my face and said, Lord, today I'll see you. It was a survival mode that, that kicked in, and it was just get out of that airplane. I said, I will jump and try and break your fall. The airplane was collapsing in on people. I immediately thought it was total destruction. Well, I felt so responsible because I couldn't take care of my passengers. And so helpless in looking back and knowing that there's nothing you can do. You can't get back in the aircraft. There's no way to get in it, and it's all on fire. Firemen are there for 12 hours trying to put out the flames, but it's a hopeless task. As the news spreads around the world, everyone wants to know, how could two state-of-the-art aircraft possibly be on the same runway at the same time? All those people dead. What had gone wrong? Who was to blame? Only later would they discover the chain of coincidences, mistakes and misunderstandings that had led to the biggest disaster in the history of aviation. The story begins at midday on the 27th of March. Pan Am Flight 1736 is nearing the Canary Islands. This has been a long, long flight. The plane left Los Angeles via New York the afternoon before. Now the passengers are tired, looking forward to journey's end in the Canaries' capital, Las Palmas. So, have you guys been to the Canaries before? You guys ever visited the Canary Islands? Yep. I had a great time there. Ah, golden beaches. Oh. Grilled fish. Midnight swims. Mm, <laughs> I could do with that. But this is the first time I've been rooted this way. Me too. It's gone quickly. Yeah. And this particular flight was one of the first ones that was what we named a fly cruise trip. Most of the passengers were retirees. Their destination was Las Palmas. Then they would board a cruise ship and do a 10-day cruise and then come back and then they would be picked up again and flown back to the United States. What no one has told the passengers is the Canary Islands have their own local brand of terrorists. They're determined to get independence from Spain, which actually owns the Canary Islands. What everyone has to understand is that the Canary Islands are at war as long as the islands are a colony, they will be at war with Spain. If the Spanish government doesn't agree to our three conditions, we'll launch full armed combat and we'll fight to the very end. Six hours out of New York? I could do it again. <laughs> Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? <laughs> On board the Pan Am plane are 380 passengers, with 11 flight attendants to look after them. I was on the flight with my best friend, Suzanne Donovan, and we used to bid flights together. And we could do that and we would, because we enjoyed each other's company so much. Hey, Susie, save some of that energy for Paris. Oh, oui, oui. <laughs> We're just going to go to Las Palmas and drop off the passengers and ferry the aircraft, which means flying it without any passengers, up to Paris and then stay in Paris. Few disasters are ever caused by a single event. It takes a chain of tiny coincidences. And so it was that day. Everything is going fine. But at that moment, the terrorists decide to act. And as luck would have it, 
they choose Gando, the airport for Las Palmas, where the Pan Am plane is due to arrive shortly. Just ahead of the Pan Am is another jumbo jet from the Dutch airline KLM. It too is heading for Gando Airport with 234 Dutch holidaymakers. The captain of the Dutch plane is Jacob van Zanten. He's KLM's star pilot. It's his face that appears in adverts all over the world. Van Zanten is so senior, he hardly flies anymore. When he's not in the photo studio, he's in a simulator training young pilots, like the man in the next seat, Klaus Mers. He'd personally given Mers his license, something which Mers is not likely to forget. You're just now looking at the arrival information for Gando? Yeah, I'll program in the alternates as well. We can do the briefing anytime. For future reference, I don't like to leave it this late in the flight, okay? I was just rechecking the procedures. No, no times to worry about here. Good. Thank you. The Dutch passengers are looking forward to journey's end too, but not all of them are going on holiday. Three are young tour guides who actually live in the Canaries. They've been back to Holland for a seminar and are now returning to their work. It's true. Back in Holland. Yeah. But I'm glad to be getting back to sitting Tenerife. I mean, how many people can say they have banana trees in their back garden? <laughs> yeah, well, a week was just good enough for me. I don't know why they send us back to Holland for their seminars. I mean, <sighs> really, it's not as if we learn anything. We're not going to suddenly sell more package deals. Hey, we got a free trip home and see our families. I'm not complaining. All right. Well, why don't we celebrate our return to this sweet life and paint Las Palmas town right tonight? Yeah. You both have fun? <laughs> Three of us went to Holland for a week. It was a kind of holiday and work. I lived on, in Puerto de la Cruz. It's a small village in northwest of Tenerife. Yvonne was traveling with me. Walter was traveling with us. And it was nice to see your colleagues every year. It was very nice atmosphere on board and a very relaxed atmosphere. There are many families on the plane taking an Easter vacation break. Among them, 53 children. There are two bombs in the terminal. You have 10 minutes to save as many lives as you wish. We'll talk again. And so it begins, the first step on the road to disaster. On the Pan Am plane, they know nothing of this. All is relaxed as the flight nears its end. You have control. Gando's already uh, dialed in there. Yeah. Crew, Gando, Las Palmas Airport in 45 Five minutes. Ah, si, si, si. Gando, Gando. Las Palmas, si. Cerro Puerto. Hombre. Ah, hand me the uh, arrival info, would you? For the passengers, a welcome sight. The flight attendants beginning to tidy up in preparation for landing. Roses. <laughs> they still look nice and fresh. Oh, lovely. Yes, a friend of mine gave them to me in the airport. I wish somebody would give me roses like that. Here, oh. take one. I insist. I had worked very hard and I was ready for a break. I had great anticipation for what we would see and hear and experience. For nearly everyone on board, this is the start of something special, the holiday they've always promised themselves. My husband and I were taking this trip to celebrate our 10th wedding anniversary. It was the first really big trip we'd been able to take because We'd been in school forever and didn't have the resources to take a trip like this before. Attention, 
At Gando Airport, the terrorist bomb explodes, badly injuring a shop assistant. Luckily, she's the only victim so far. Approach. Security here. We've had an explosion in the terminal and we've been told to expect another. We've got to close the airport now. You need to divert all inbound traffic. Of course, right away. Gando, KLM 4805 is with you now. Flight level 350, inbound, request approach. KLM 4805, Gando, the airport is closed. Divert to Los Oleos Airport via Tenerife VOR. Descent flight level 250. Well, how do you like that? I'm in serious danger of missing my dinner. <laughs> 250 for you now. 50. This diversion is bad news for the Dutch pilots. They're only allowed to fly a certain number of hours, and they still have to get back to Amsterdam. Gando, Pan Am 1736, good afternoon. Uh, we're on flight level 370, 120 miles west, inbound approach. Pan Am 1736, Gando, the airport is closed. Divert to Los Oleos Airport via Tenerife VOR. Descent flight level 250. We filled her up at New York. Ask them if we can wait. What would you say, George? Two hours up here? Uh, two hours easy. Uh, Gando, uh, 1736 requests a hold over Las Palmas. We have enough fuel to wait about two hours. Negative, sir. I say again, the airport is closed. We had an explosion in the terminal. There's already a long line of aircraft in front of you. Expect all at Los Rodeos. Contact Canaries Approach now on 118 decimal five. <sighs> well, that's just great. I think they just had so much traffic to deal with, they didn't have time to even consider giving an airplane clearance to hold or whatever. So that's, that's what I assume that they were, had made up their mind that they were just diverting everyone to Tenerife. So now both jumbo jets, along with many other aircraft, find themselves heading for Los Rodeos Airport on the island of Tenerife, half an hour away. It turns out to be a regional airport, more used to dealing with light aircraft than Boeing 747s. It has only one runway and about as much parking space as the average supermarket, but it's the only airport within striking distance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Grubb speaking. Uh, we've just been told by air traffic control to land at Tenerife, which is about a half hour flying time from Las Palmas. Apparently there are some difficulties in the airport. Uh, we're working the radios up here to see if there's a way that we can get you over to Las Palmas just as soon as we can on the ground. I'll let you know when we have some more information on that. Thank you for your patience. When they made the announcement that we were not going to be able to land right then at Las Palmas. Mostly, I was frustrated because it had been a really long trip, <laughs> and uh, I was tired and time changes and this and that. So I, I guess I would say that the chief feeling was frustration and sadness that we couldn't immediately disembark and get on a boat. People were not happy about this because it was not a good omen, you know. It was not a good omen having this take place. For the air traffic controllers at Los Rodeos, it's not good news either. It's Sunday and they're short-staffed. In the tower, there are only the two of them. Enough on a normal day, but today there threatens to be as much traffic as a motorway on a bank holiday Monday. They had only think, what do they want? That makes four planes already and two 747s on the way. So what have we got? Panam 747. KLM 747. KLM 4805, you are number three behind the 737. Report outer marker. 4805, follow the 737. Report outer marker. My God, I've seen postage stamps bigger than this place. God, we're gonna get boxed in here. God damn it. Anyone care to hear about the landing checklist? Class, you're flying. You've got to call the landing checklist. Landing checklist, please. Auto brake. 
Uh, on medium, you never know. Runway short, and on top of it might be slippery. Be careful. Lima Tango 107, you are clear to set to flight level 80, holding pattern. At Los Rodeos, planes are pouring in one after the other. Sunjet 282, switch to ground now on 118.7. Sunjet 282, switching to 118.7. Good day. God damn it. Of all the days, this has to happen. Just when Spain is going to teach Hungary a lesson in football. I don't know. For sure, it's bad timing. <laughs> How are we supposed to get all these planes down? That Sunday, the two controllers find themselves thrust into a situation that's way over their heads. Los Rodeos had never seen so many big aircraft all at once. Contact, stand by for taxi clearance. Sunjet will take your place. You can begin your taxi just after it passes behind you. Break, Spantax, hold on. Hey, say, where are you going to put the KLM? Next to the breathe in 737. No choice. Still waiting for the Pan Am 747. Yeah, but that's two large carriers. It won't be easy to handle. You gotta leave some room for these other planes that want to roll. Panam 1736, leave level 230 now for level 120, call back crossing 180. The Pan Am plane begins its approach. Now 1736, clear to flight level 120, report crossing 180. The passengers are fed up. After 13 hours in the air, they're wondering when it's all going to end. Say, uh, why the diversion? Is anything wrong at the airport? Uh, no, just a slight technical difficulty. It'll be cleared up in no time. Nothing serious? No, nothing to worry about. At the back of everyone's minds is, how long is this diversion going to last? Is it going to jeopardize their crews? Will they miss the boat? Their tour guide reassures them. Hello everyone, this is Bo Moss speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, our cruise ship, the Golden Odyssey, has got its engines running and will, I've been told, come out to pick us up if this delay should continue. So it will be just a few minutes longer. Please bear with us. Auto brake selector on medium. We did the landing checklist. Auto brakes, medium. KLM 4805, clear to land, runway 30. Roger, 4805, clear to land, 30. Grandma didn't spill her tea. Next time, just get the plane stopped. Don't eat up all the runway. You never know. OK? All right. I think he wants us to park parallel to the 737. All right. You've got room on my side. You can turn. Stop. Break here. Stop. All right, that'll do, that'll do. Good, good, good. Los Radios ground, KLM 4805. 4805 ground. Yes, uh, any idea how long we're going to be here? Negative 4805. We're waiting for the word from Gondo. Well, then, we need to get our passengers in the terminal so they can be more comfortable. How many passengers do you have on board? 273 passengers. I'd rather not have them in here moaning and complaining. Roger, we're sending a passenger bus. Thank you. But this might only take a few minutes. Or it could be hours. <laughs> you want to tell them to stay in there? The controllers are now stuck in the middle of a traffic jam, the likes of which have never been seen before at this airport. The tarmac is getting bumper to bumper. Miguel, take a look at this. Uh, make it fast, man. We already got two aircraft blocking Charlie 1 and Charlie 2. The only option is to start landing them up down here. Not everyone's going to make that turn onto Charlie 3. I already thought about that. We can squeeze the Pan Am 747 through here. 
How do you get them out if we ever do get them out? We'll have to backtrack them. Taxi down here, turn around, take off. He's gone, do the next one. We'll be here all night, you know that, right? Or you can go out there and pave us another runway. <laughs> Maybe I do that. Rodeo's approach, Pan Am 1736. There is some method in their madness. Sooner or later, they'll have to get all these aircraft out again. Since all the taxiways are blocked with aircraft, what they propose to do is to use the main runway as a taxiway instead. The planes will take it in turns to taxi down to the far end, turn round and take off. Ladies and gentlemen, we apologize for this delay. While the, flight crew the Dutch plane waits on the ramp. Its passengers should be spending this afternoon on the beach. Instead, they learn they're going to spend it hanging around the departure lounge of a small airport. Are you the last foot I guess? No. We're going to visit another airport first, as Rodeos. Then we'll be going to the Spanish. Okay? Last few days. Yes. Go on. Let's get your shoes on. It is weird. Robina, Walter and Yvonne actually live and work on this island. This like so when they eventually get to Las Palmas, so they'll have to get another plane to bring them straight back again. Well, maybe we could get off here. Yeah, and what about our bags? You're so materialistic. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you want to see Paul doesn't mean the rest of us have Robina wants to see her boyfriend Paul in Tenerife tonight, not spend it in Las Palmas. <laughs> I miss him so much after this week in Holland. I could skip Las Palmas, to be honest with you. Ah, we're moving. Let's go. You all right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You don't like it. It's not right. There's all these planes. Uh, I, I get a bad feeling about this. I can remember so well his words because he was standing next to me and he was looking outside and he said, uh, this, this is going to go wrong, this can't go right. Because of a terrorist bomb explosion, dozens of planes have been diverted to a small airport on the island of Tenerife in the Canaries. One of the first to arrive is a KLM jumbo jet. Its passengers are taken to the terminal. But what with those arriving, those departing, and those, like the Dutch, who are in transit, the little terminal is becoming overwhelmed. Pan Am 1736, short final for 3-0. Pan Am 1736, clear to land, 3-0. And now the Pan Am is arriving, just to make matters worse. Instructions. Have you got him inside? Affirmative, sir. 1736, you will be just behind three other planes. Have you got them inside? Looks a bit tight in there. 1736, be careful of your jet blast. When you turn, there's a plane just next to you. The ground situation was a traffic jam, because when we landed there, the ramp was so crowded with other airplanes, and we were directed to taxi down to the end of the ramp area and park behind three other airplanes. And basically, that's all we saw. And we didn't know when the airport at Las, at Las Palmas was going to open, so we, we really didn't leave the airplane area, let's say. By this time, the terminal is so full, there's no room for the Pan Am passengers they'll have to stay on board their aircraft. After 14 hours stuck inside it, they're not happy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've authorized a door to be opened and the stair ramp set in place so that anyone who wants can walk down and stretch their legs. Uh, unfortunately, due to the number of other airliners here now, we cannot get near the terminal. Uh, I know we've all had a long day already, so 
I hope that we can get you out of here in about an hour or so. Thank you very much. They actually allowed us to get off the plane and just to walk downstairs and stand on the tarmac, stretch our legs. I think everybody was getting weary of traveling and ready to start their vacation. They opened the doors to give us air and we could look out. It was cloudy, cloudy and overcast. It kept darkening down and was not, not nice like we had hoped it would be. Everyone had been expecting tropical sunshine. Instead, it's damp and misty with clouds as far as the eye can see. I'm worried we're going to get caught by this fog. All we need now is for them to close down that runway. Yeah, we need them to get a move on or else mm. we'll be spending the night here and then hello duty time limits. Any idea of how much longer we've got before we need to get another crew down to take over? Yeah, well, it says here that the company time limits are 10 hours of flight and an amplitude of 13 hours, and that's with one stopover. But if there are two, it goes down to 9 in 11. But we're allowed to ask for a derogation. <laughs> Jesus Christ, who writes this stuff here? I'm going, to, I'm going to back time from when we have to be back at Schip Hall to stay legal, right? What happens if we go over the civil and company time limits? Oh. Well, you get hung out to dry. You lose your license, your career, everything. That's it, it's all settled. We can stay here in Tenerife. It's so stupid to go to Las Palmas now. We just have to come back tomorrow. And Paul's waiting. Let's get a taxi. Hey, hey, slow down. Can't Paul wait another 24 hours? And they were making plans. You know, we're going to have dinner here, and then we're going to have a drink there, and we just wanted to go back to him. In the end, it's love that saves Rubina. I met Rubina in the December 1976. I fell in love, and we've never been... Uh, Separated not again afterwards. Why don't I pick up the bags and see you guys and stay again? <laughs> stay. You know, Walter and I actually know how to have a good time without you. Yeah. <laughs> You'd just be a drag anyway, thinking about Paul the whole time. Really? Uh, right. <laughs> uh, ex Excuse me. Is everything all right? Yes, we're all right. Uh, I am a bit peckish, though. Maybe we could get something to eat. I'm sorry. There is nothing left on board. Maybe just a cup of coffee and a biscuit? Not even that. I'm sorry. I really am. That was a long four hours without coffee or pop or anything. We had no food to serve. We, we had only the one meal that had been boarded in New York. We'd already served that before landing. And that was really all we had to serve. In the tower, the two controllers are also getting fed up. All the aircraft are in now, so there's nothing to do except listen to the football on the radio and worry. Clouds are gathering over the airport. Looks like we might have a Campana. Yeah, these clouds are ready to jump down. A little more coastal wind, a drop in temperature. And we'll be covered in clouds. Better get a move on or they won't be taking off. Right. Rodeos, Rodeos, Gando. Rodeos, go ahead. Gando to Tenerife ATC. We've just reopened. Temperature is 20 degrees. Winds light and variable. Arrivals running 2-4. Gando will start sending them your way. We're at 14 degrees, fog and light rain. They'll be glad to get out of here. Let's get started. <laughs> it should be tricky getting all these planes in line. I will be all right. We'll just have to take it slow. Uh, no doubt about that. I just hope we won't still be here tomorrow. At last, everyone can leave. Well, here we go. Yeah. To all aircraft, Gando is reopened. You can ask for startup and clearances at your discretion. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Gando Airport has reopened. Your flights will be reporting short. Please make your way back to the gate as quickly as possible when your flight is called. Thank you for your attention.
para el embarque. Boarding was very complicated because when the passengers were called for their flights, they were scattered throughout the airport, in the cafeteria or buying souvenirs. We had to go around the map, and in fact, some passengers never did board the aircraft. Okay, right, so we need to leave within the hour, then make it a short stop over at Las Palmas and we'll stay legal, all right? Willem, since we're trapped in here until the passengers get back, we might as well take on some fuel. Yeah, no, let's do that at Gando, it's less expensive there, right? Yeah, exactly, I mean, we've got enough to... Mm. There might be many planes wanting fuel at Las Palmas, huh? or who knows, we'll be in a halt if Gander Slut closed down again. While I'm sitting here in this seat, I make the decisions. She might have a point there. Refueling before they take off will affect everything that happens from now on. Uh, RAF, uh, KLM 4805 requesting refueling. Yes? We're going to refuel during passenger boarding. Apply the necessary security measures. Information lights on, Tobogam's armed with for doors without step ladders. And do you know when we will be in the air again? My crew is starting to wonder about the shift time. Tell them whatever they like. I'm trying to save us some time here, okay? Certainly, Captain. In order to keep the weight down at takeoff, the normal practice is to take on just the amount of fuel you need, plus a margin for safety. But the Dutch captain takes on 55 tons, enough to get him not just to Las Palmas, but all the way back to Amsterdam. That decision will have unexpected consequences for everyone. Inside the terminal, all the passengers are called to rejoin their flights, but two Dutch children are missing. They've slipped outside to explore. You go this way, I'll go check the bottom. Let's meet at the gate in five minutes. All right. Meanwhile, Rubina is trying to get off the KLM flight. Although I do understand your wish to stay. Yes, this is where I'm coming tomorrow, so there's no point in going all the way back to Las Palmas. Yes, I guess this here. is just against company rules, and as much as I would like to help you, I'm afraid you must take this place. At least you can't change the, the rules just for me. But there's no harm in trying, right? Have a nice day. Thanks. KLM might not be willing to bend their rules, but Rabina decides to bend them anyway. Problem? Kind of. What? But I'm staying anyway. <laughs> They'll just have to arrest me. I'll pick up the bags for you. Thanks. I'll walk to the door with you guys so that my friend here thinks I'm taking the plane. Let's go. Come on. They wanted me to go with them, and they really tried to persuade me, and I tried to persuade them to stay. Yeah, and, uh, yeah but that's that's how it goes. Yeah. Fortune had smiled upon Robina van Lanscott. Of the 234 passengers on her flight, she would be the only one left alive. Temperature is 14 and falling. The dew point is 12, not a good sign. The visibility is going to drop like a rock. Weather. Hi guys, it's Fernando. What's the current visibility? Got it. Keep us posted if it changes, okay? In the meantime, we're going to let them go. The controllers need to move quickly before the weather closes them down. But some planes can't move. Rodeo's ground, Pan Am 1736 request clearance. Las Palmas latest weather and taxi instructions. 1736, there is a delay for you. The KLM in front of you is refueling. Oh, come on, let's try to get around him. But there's going to be a revolt back there if we don't get moving soon. Uh, ground, uh, we'll try to sneak past him here. 
The Pan Am captain does his best. He starts his engines and tries to squeeze past. But a 747 is nearly 200 feet long. It's not built for squeezing. Not enough room. Uh, George, why don't we get a breath of fresh air and uh, take a look? The engineer and I went out underneath the right wing and basically stepped off the distance between our wingtip and the KLM 747's wingtip, and we were 12 feet short of being able to taxi easily around the airplane. For the sake of 12 feet, hundreds of lives are going to be lost. Did you notice that when we were coming in? The volcano, amazing, isn't it? Legend has it that the devil himself lives on Mount Tate. 12,000 feet, highest point in Spain. It's always in the clouds. You must get socked in here all the time. Yeah, warm, moist air comes screaming across the Atlantic, hits this island, gets cooled down, and wham, you're in the soup. Now the tourists start screaming. KLM 4805, this is Pan Am 1736. Bonjour, Anthony. Uh, we're stuck behind you guys. Have you got any ideas to what time you'll be rolling? 35 minutes. Scale him out. He hung up. Oh. Nice man. We're stuck behind him. That's all he's got to say. What an ass. On the KLM, more frustration. That's the count. We're missing four. It must be the family from row 33. All right. I let you tell the captain. I help prepare the cabin for the cough. Gee, thanks. I know. Roberto, you have to find them. Please, hurry up. Please. Okay. Captain? Yes. What is it now? We're missing four passengers. We have the 273 passengers back there who will be spending the night in here if we don't get moving. Now, unless you want to be locked in there with them, I suggest you get over to the terminal and drag them in here now. On the Pan Am plane, the passengers have had enough. Most of them left home some 18 or 20 hours previously. They've been up all night, stuck in an airplane seat. They're tired jet-lagged, and they understand less and less why all these other planes seem to be taking off, but not them. My friends, I know it's been a trying afternoon for all of us, but when we are finally on board the Golden Odyssey, you will be pampered day and night. Your own private telephone will give you access to room service at all hours. A twist of the button will give you just the right temperature. Queen-size beds will make you forget these airplane seats. Miss, uh, I can see the other planes are taking off. What's the holdup? I mean, we were here longer than those other planes. We'll be leaving in just a moment. Thinking of Paris, I guess. <laughs> you can keep thinking about it. Yep. Yeah. Moulin Rouge, maybe? The old Moulin Rouge. Dancing Girls? Dancing Girls. There we get there. Ah, we get there. Around about this time, the ground controller, Roberto, manages to find the two missing Dutch children. Where have you been? Come on, hurry up. They're only waiting for you to take off. He takes them back to their plane, and as it happens, to their deaths. Y lo 
I never forget that. If I hadn't found them, they'd be alive today. But was it destiny? Calling to start. Ground. KLM 4805 is ready for startup. 4805, clear to start. Checklist before startup. Plane free, blocks in place, doors shut and checked. Ready for startup in sequence one, two, three, four. Affirmative, ready on one. The KLM pilots start their engines one by one and prepare to go back out onto the runway for takeoff. If the weather were good, there'd be no problem at all. But everything is changing rapidly, and for the worse. That's in company is here, the spirit is right down. We've fallen from 10 to 3 kilometers in the past half hour. But there's good wind, there will be some hole. Yeah, but let's face it, the weather's not going to get any better. Approach uh, 4805, uh, requires backtrack on runway 12 for takeoff on 30. Taxi straight ahead to end of runway and make a backtrack. Uh, Roger, make a backtrack. Uh, 4805 is now on the runway. The KLM is now back on the runway. The Pan Am prepares to follow them a few hundred meters behind, through the fog which is getting thicker by the minute. 1736, ready to start. Pan Am 1736, you are clear to start. Thank well. you. Please make sure your seat belts are fastened, your tray tables are closed, and your hand baggage is stowed beneath the seat in front of you. The weather's taking a real dive here. Yeah, looks like we're getting sucked in. <laughs> hey, ask him to turn down the fog machine, will you? Panam 1736 clear to taxi on runway following the KLM. Panam 1736 following KLM. Basically, our instructions were to follow KLM, to backtrack down the runway. Now, backtrack means that you're taxiing down the runway in the opposite direction of the takeoff, following KLM. 335 tons of Boeing 747 turn out onto the runway. At first, traveling at about 15 kilometers an hour, but not for long. A fog bank started on the right hill. This particular airport is situated between two fairly big hills. And we saw the fog bank come off of the right hill and proceed down and stop right on the runway. So our visibility went from unlimited to 500 meters. We lost sight of the KLM airplane. I'll have two planes tailing on the runway. Keep, keep some healthy separation. Visibility is dropping every second. Now they can't see much either. They certainly can't. The KLM plane is groping its way through fog. barely see the pavement. We're down to 50 knots ground speed, Scott. Taxi checklist. This is a nightmare. We'll never make the limits at this rate. And I really don't want to be spending the night at Las Palmas. I'll give headquarters a Taxi call. Taxi checklist. Time. Please. EPR, ADI, safety compass. Uh, compared and checked. Okay, we're massing 200 tons with uh, 55 tons of fuel. The parameters are checked and verified by myself. Rolling checklist completed. The two aircraft are following each other on the same runway, but no one can see a thing. Everyone is nervous, especially the American pilots. They know that before long, the KLM will turn round and come back down the runway at full speed, taking off. They have to get off the runway, but where? Pan Am 1736. 
1736, approach. Um, we were also instructed to taxi down the runway, is that correct? Affirmative. Taxi into the runway. And leave the runway third. Third to your left. Third to the left, okay. Third, he said? Three. Third. Third to your left. I, I thought he leave said Leave the first. runway third to your left. Third to your left. Yeah. Left turn. And look at it out there. I mean, this cloud just rolled right onto us. I, I don't think anybody has the minimums now. In a 747, the pilots are more than 10 meters off the ground. It's very difficult to see out. And it's built to fly, not to drive down a highway in thick fog, trying to find an exit. Tell me what you think, George. Yeah. No. We've got center line markings only. We need 800 meters visibility if we don't have the lights. Anytime you get a low visibility, such as that, on the back of the approach plates, you have the runway information. It gives you the minimum visibility you must have to be able to take off. We turned our charts over, and it said RVR, minimum 700 meters visibility. So we assumed that with that, he'd just given us 500 meters. We couldn't take off. Tells me this isn't going to be over anytime soon. KLM 4805, how many taxiway did you pass? Uh, I think we just passed uh, Charlie 4 right now. Okay, at the end of the runway, make 180 and report. Uh, report for ATC clearance. Okay, sir. Uh, tell me, is centerline uh, lighting available for 4805? Uh, I don't think so. Stand by, I will check. The Pan Am is still traveling along the runway behind them, but very slowly now, because the pilots are confused. They thought they might have misheard the controller. Did he say the third exit, or was it the first? The first one was a 90-degree turn. Yeah, OK. This one down here is a 45 must be the third. But this third exit seems to be an impossible turn for a 747. There must be some mistake. The logical exit is the next one, Charlie 4. It's only a 45 degree angle and leads to where they want to go. I'll ask them again. Uh, uh, would you confirm that you want Pan Am 1736 to turn left at the third intersection? The third one, sir. One, two, three. Third, third one. One, two. Good, well, that's what we need, right? The third one. Uno, dos, tres. Right. One, seven, three, six, report, runway clear. Pan Am, one, seven, three, six. We couldn't see any taxiways. We couldn't see barely the center line of the runway we were taxiing on. But we knew that the 45 degree angle to the left was a taxiway we were supposed to take. One kilometer ahead and out of sight in the fog, the KLM is nearing the end of the runway. 4805 and Panam 1736, for your information, the center line lighting is out of service. 4805, we copied that. Why am I not surprised? Wouldn't make any much difference anyway. You need a bunch of searchlights to punch a hole through this mess. Back in the control tower, things are becoming stressful too. For several minutes, they've been unable to see either of these two big jumbo jets on the runway. They don't have ground radar like a big airport. To all intents and purposes, they're working blind. I lost them. I can see no visual contact. I hate working like this blind when the planes are on the ground. Even they don't know where they are. They're doing well, I mean, There's good separation distance. Panam 1736, approach. Position, please. 1736, just checking. Yeah, that's the 45 there. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's uh, this one here. Yeah, I know. Okay, uh, the next one is almost a 45. Uh, yeah, but it goes, yeah, but it goes ahead. I think it'll take us to the taxiway. Yeah, right? just a little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah, for I mean, sure. Maybe he counts these as three. Oh. oh, I like this. On the KLM, Captain Van Zanten knows that he is now very close to the minimum visibility for takeoff. There's a good chance he's going to be trapped on the ground, forced to spend the night at Los Rodeos. Not an enticing prospect. Christ, bloody water. Class, give me takeoff speeds. We are okay. Uh, the V1 will be 120 knots and the VR is 135 knots. I'm preparing the frequencies uh, 139 and 138.7. Lights on. Affirmative. It's probes as well. Of course, the people in the back have no idea about any of this. The way that everything is clicking into place. That's it. Just one last hop and we'll be there. Okay? Kitty. Is it going to be a long holiday? Just like last year. The only thing which might alert them is the fact that the view from their windows is now down to just a few dozen metres. Where's the wing gone? It's hidden by the fog. What? A frog? A big green frog? <laughs> Don't be silly, just calm down. <laughs> Chewing gum to pop your ears. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. I wonder if Rubina will have a good time tonight. Oh, are you worrying about her? Oh, she always manages to have a good time. That's true. At the end of the runway, the plane begins its 180 degree turn. How many have taken off now? Feels like we've been texting for hours. I can't see anything. Uh, do you think they can see any better out the front? Maybe, yeah. Yeah? There's a lot of fog out there. It's just after 5 p.m. The two aircraft are now face to face, a kilometer apart, unable to see each other in the fog. Okay, we're on the numbers now. Can't be far from the threshold. You can just about see the white center line. I've left the body gear on to uh, help you turn around. I've got eight greens on the undercarriage. Wipers on. Lights are on. I said, wipers on. All right, there you go. OK, we have 700 meters visibility here now. Wait a minute. We don't have ATC clearance. I know that. Go ahead, ask. Uh, KLM 4805 uh, is now ready for takeoff. Um, we're waiting for ATC clearance. KLM 4805, you're clear to the Papa Beacon. ATC clearance is the route the aircraft intends to take once it's left Los Rodeos. But it's not permission to take off. That has to be obtained separately. Las Palmas VOR. Roger, sir, we're cleared to the Papa Beacon, uh, flight level 90. Uh, right turn out 040 until intercepting the 325. Um, we're now. We're going. No! Stand by for takeoff, I will call and, and you. We're still taxiing down the runway. Pan Am 1736. Pan Am 1736, report runway clear. Okay, we'll report runway clear. Thank you, 1736. He asked us, were we off the runway? And I responded back, negative. We are still on the runway, but we will report clear of the runway. That was the last thing I said over the radio. Let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, he's anxious, isn't he? Yeah, and now he's in a rush. We were only taxing at three miles an hour. Nothing in my mind would have even given me the thought that he was taking off. Isn't it clear then? What do you say? Isn't it clear that Pan Am? Oh, yes. The die is cast. With every second, the KLM is going faster and faster. At the same moment, the Pan Am reaches the number four exit and begins to turn off the runway. God damn, that son of a bitch is coming straight at us!
when he hit us, I didn't think he'd done us that much damage because the airplane very quickly shuddered. The first thing was this huge, loud noise. And the only thing I could liken it to is as, as if each molecule of air exploded. That's the way I thought of it afterwards. It just was so loud. At first, I thought they had gotten to us the bomb, and it came up and slammed down. The lights went out, and flames came through. I had my, put my hands over my face and said, Lord, today I'll see you. The minute I opened my eyes, I looked in the cabin, and everything was on fire. All the windows were going in the cockpit. I looked out to the right, the right wing was on fire. I looked back to the left. We had 28 people in the upstairs lounge. The lounge was no longer on the airplane. It was just a big hole there. And I could see all the way to the tail of the airplane, just like someone had taken a big knife and cut the top off. People were just sitting in their seats. They weren't moving. I don't know why. Yeah, in normal circumstances, you're supposed to wait for a command, but it was clear and you didn't need to wait for a command in this situation. There was fire, and I shouted to Suzanne, fire on the wing. She ran back to my exit and saw Suzanne standing there, getting ready to open the door, and just saw the door crumple like cheap tin foil. And I thought, oh my god, we're trapped. I was staring at the door, and I yelled, unfasten your seatbelts, remove your shoes, leave everything, come this way. And as I stared at the door, a jagged hole seemed to open up in the roof over the door. And the next thing I knew, I was outside that. I, I don't know how I got out there. Joan was standing there yelling, Suzanne, take my hand. And I was standing above the level of the door on fuselage rubble pieces. And I leaned down and said to Suzanne, give me your hand. She grabbed me out with one hand. I mean, I don't know how she lifted me. And then we were standing up on top of the, almost on top of this airplane. And I thought, it's really a long ways down. If we jump, we're gonna break our legs. We were on debris. It was like ice flows, big chunks of fuselage kind of moving all around. The engines were starting to disintegrate already. We could hear them disintegrating and throwing metal. I lost Joan's hand very quickly. So I jumped, and it was about, it seemed like the leap from a second story building. The captain, he elected to jump down in the first class section of the airplane. And when he hit the first class floor, the floor collapsed and he fell on down in the cargo area. It was so hot that the oxygen bottles exploded and burned him very badly, as a matter of fact. It was a survival mode that, that kicked in and it was just get out of that airplane. I didn't stop to think about how it happened. I went to where the door would have been, and I left my wife seated. And then uh, it came to me, what am I doing? I should, where, where's my wife? So I turned around, and she was coming. And I said, I will jump and try and break your fall. My husband was sitting to my right, and, and I undid his seat belt and kind of pushed him out of his seat to get him moving and we headed for the door that was closest to us. And it was engulfed in flames, and there was no way to exit that way. I looked over, and at some point, someone had opened the other door, which was amazing to me. And I just yelled over here and headed toward the door on the other side, <clears throat> which was, again, the wing door. Um, in the haste to get out of the burning plane, Karen became separated from her husband. He died in the flames. I immediately thought it was total destruction. It never dawned on me that I would make it. But I, I thought, hey, you know, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. I just went over the seat backs, and I'm not that athletic, really, but <laughs> I went over three rows of seats. One man was sitting there looking like I need help, but I couldn't help him. When KLM hit us, all communication stopped. The tower called and couldn't get any response, or either the KLM or ourselves. 
There was an airplane in the holding pattern right above Tenerife. Called the tower and said, I see smoke and wreckage on your runway. Rodeus approach Sterling 105. We're downwind from runway 30 and something's glowing on the field. Looks like a fire. Are you aware of any fire? Shit, this can't be true! Come on, come on! Come on, come on! He hits the emergency warning. After KLM hit us, he went on down the runway and hit on the runway 1,500 feet down, closer to the tower. So when the fire truck and the ambulance came out, they got to him first. So no one came to us for quite a while. As a matter of fact, I remember thinking, I wonder why somebody hasn't gotten out here to help us. It's complete bedlam. In the fog, the fire trucks don't know where to go. When they eventually find the Dutch plane, it's hopeless. Everyone's dead. And the whole time, they don't realize there's a second plane a short distance away, hidden in the mist, with people waiting to be saved. It's another 20 minutes before the Pan Am plane is discovered. I had no idea that 50 meters away, there was a plane on fire with people still alive inside. I would say over and over, don't worry, the ambulances will be here soon. Help is on the way, because you assume that somebody has seen this and taken note and is sent for the emergency equipment. It's hard to call what we did an evacuation. It just seemed to be people got out where holes were provided. It all seemed a matter of total luck. When I arrived, I saw the aircraft in two pieces, the captain lying bleeding on the ground, staring at the plane, people staggering about crying, people running, people calling out for members of their family, not knowing if they were still in the plane or whether they had got out, not knowing if they were dead. It was a scene of absolute chaos. <laughs> Only 20% of the Pan Am passengers get out alive and most of them are gathered on the left wing, which has somehow miraculously remained intact. The entire left wing of the airplane was covered with passengers. And it turned out there were probably 45 to 50 passengers out on that wing. I've never asked anybody how high the wing is from the ground on a 747, but it looks to be a very long ways. And I cut open my head and fractured my foot. My wife jumped after me, and she said, I cannot walk. And I dragged her on her side for probably a block and a half away from the plane. The motors were going full tilt, and I didn't want to get over where the motors were, so I sat down by the body of the plane. I had no comprehension at that moment that I would be jumping off the wing and... <laughs> In the debris, you knew there were trapped passengers and people, and there was absolutely nothing you could do to help because the airplane was collapsing in on people. Only one door was opened by a crew member, and that was one of the black flight attendants who did that. And she lost her life when the engine disintegrated and debris hit her. And I thought if we could just walk around to the other side of the plane, we would find all of the passengers and our other fellow crew members, which of course wasn't the case. Even 20 minutes after the disaster, the controllers in the tower still have no idea how serious things are. Departing aircraft, all departures are suspended until advised. Hello. We need every vehicle they've got. We 
done. It's can't be our fault, I mean, I, I told him to clear the taxiway. When I got out on the ground, I could hear people screaming and yelling and all. Within about five minutes, you heard absolutely nothing. There was no noise at all, just the, air, the airplane burning. I asked one of our medical directors later on what had caused that, and he said that when you have a fire that hot and that much of a fire, it consumes all of the oxygen in there, and people basically suffocate. I felt so responsible because I couldn't take care of my passengers and so helpless in looking back and knowing that there's nothing you can do. You can't get back in the aircraft. There's no way to get in it and it's all on fire. Of the KLM plane, very little remains. It had continued flying for another 400 meters before slamming into the ground. The 55 tons of fuel it had taken on ensured that everyone on board died in the fiery explosion. It was personal vehicles, cars and trucks, that seemed to come onto the grass and gather up people. About 75% of our surviving passengers got to the hospital in taxi cabs. It was a wild, crazy ride as we were going to the hospital. The skin was hanging on both hands because I had received burns, but it hadn't affected my eyes. I had blood all over me and I walked up to somebody and said, I'm a doctor, can I help? And the guy that I talked, said it to had the oddest look on his face, just this um, very wan smile and he just shook his head and then, then I immediately went into a coma. Word soon gets out. And in the hours that follow, the international press begin to arrive, and the first news is flashed around the world. The rescue workers are still going through the wreckage of the two jet liners this morning in the Canary Islands. They're looking for the bodies of victims in this worst accident in aviation history. Two jumbo jet liners, 747s, collided on the ground at the airport at Santa Cruz de Tenerife yesterday morning. One was a Pan Am charter from Los Angeles that picked up more people in New York before flying to the Canaries. The other was a KLM charter from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. They set up a, a, a morgue in one of the hangars and it was huge and they had all of the nearly 600 bodies in, in that particular hangar or temporary morgue. The death toll rises to 583 people nearly twice as big as any previous accident. And then everyone begins asking the same questions. How and why could two state-of-the-art airliners smash into each other on the same runway? Very soon, a whole army of investigators begins arriving from the three countries involved, Spain, Holland, and the United States. Under the rules that govern this sort of thing, they all have a right to be there, but that doesn't mean they're going to get along. In Spain, the military still runs everything, including aviation. When the American team from the National Transportation Safety Board arrives, the Spanish general in charge won't even let them into the room. I sneaked in and I went to the general and I told him, the general, uh, my name is Luis Carmona. I represent the US government, the NTSB, and I am here to participate in the investigation. He answered back to me, uh, I represent the king and you get out. <laughs> so as I walk, was walking out, he looked at me again and he said, hey, you don't look American. And uh, I told him, well, yes, I am an American, but I was born in Cuba. And he said, well, so, so did I. I was also born in Cuba. So he turned around, then he asked me questions and asked me to bring my team in, and we started uh, doing the accident investigation then. The investigators discover the chain of coincidences that had led remorselessly to the deaths of 583 people. If any one of them had not occurred, neither would the accident. The first had nothing to do with airplanes. 
a terrorist bombing perpetrated by a small group fighting for their independence. Their intent was to create publicity for their cause. In that, they certainly succeeded. There are two bombs in the terminal. You have 10 minutes to save as many lives as you wish. The airport is closed. Divert to Los Oleos Airport via Tenerife VOR. Descent flight level 250. Because of the bomb, all air traffic was rerouted to Los Rodeos Airport on the neighboring island of Tenerife. But it's a small regional airfield with only one runway. A 747 can land there. The runway is long enough, but that's all. The airport is ill-equipped and unable to handle that amount of planes or people. Descent to flight level 80. Subject 282, switch the ground now. Contact standby for taxi clearance. KLM 4805, clear to land runway 30. Panam 1736. Panam 1736, short final. As luck would have it, this tidal wave of traffic happens on a Sunday afternoon when there are just two controllers on duty. They're good, but not used to handling as many airplanes as on that day. Big airplanes that need lots of room to park. They are confronted with an enormous jigsaw puzzle. We'll be here all night, you know that, right? Or you can go out there and pave us another runway. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the KLM cockpit, the stress is mounting. Any idea of how much longer we've got before we need to get another crew down to take over? Yeah, well... KLM had recently introduced new company rules, which handed out severe penalties for pilots who exceeded their flying hours. What happens if we go over the civil and company time limits? Well, you get hung out to dry. You lose your license, your career, everything. The KLM plane has to get away before 5.30 that afternoon or abandon the flight. Hundreds of passengers would then have to be found hotels on this small island. A new crew would have to be flown in from Amsterdam. The expense would be enormous. Willem. Since we're trapped in here until the passengers get back, we might as well take them some fuel. But that seemingly simple decision seals the fate of everyone aboard the KLM. Refueling not only delays him for half an hour and the Pan Am stuck behind him, it makes the KLM plane so heavy it'll be unable to lift off and clear the Pan Am plane on the runway. The half-hour delay has another effect. During that time, the weather changes abruptly. Los Rodeos is an unusual airport. It's on a plateau high in the hills. Los Rodeos airport is, uh, is at 2,000 feet elevation. And the normal clouds in the area, they, they stay about 2,000 feet. So when the wind blows the clouds over the airport, it closes the airport, the, the, the visibility goes to zero. And it goes on and off, on and off all the time. Unfortunately, for an airport that's constantly lost in fog, Los Rodeos is ill-equipped to deal with it. It has no ground radar so that controllers can see where the planes are. In fact, the facilities are downright primitive. When he was not, they had a person sitting in a building next to the runway, and he just took a visual uh, measurement of the weather, and that's, that's how the weather was uh, checked. And that's about all. In the fog that day, both aircraft are invisible to the controllers. I lost them. I can see no visual contact. There are no runway center lights working either. Visibility is on the borderline of what is safe. In fact, as far as the Pan Am crew is concerned, it's below the legal minimum, so no aircraft can take off. Look at it out there. I mean, this cloud just rolled right onto us. I don't think anybody has the minimums now but the Dutch are working to a different set of rules. The scene is all set for a disaster. What will actually trigger it? The Dutch investigators thought they'd found the reasons. God damn it, of all the days this has to happen. Just when Spain is gonna teach Hungary a lesson in football. The controllers, they say, were listening to the football on the radio. Perhaps their minds weren't on the job. Furthermore, their bad English had confused the pilots. Taxi into the runway. 
And leave the runway third. Third to your left. Third to the left, okay. Third, he said? Three. Third. Third to your left. I, I thought he leave said Leave the first. runway third to your left. Third. third one, sir. One, two, three. Third. Third one. One, two. Good. Well, that's what we need, right? The third one. Uno, dos, tres. We were listening to the controller talking to the other airplanes. We were listening to the controller giving the ATC clearances, the taxi clearances. And he spoke clear enough English for anyone, I think. So I'd have to say, no, I don't think the controller was involved at all. Uh, I don't think he had any fault at all in, in this accident. 1736, just check in. Yeah, that. that's the 45 there. But the yeah. Dutch haven't finished yet. Yeah, that's uh, this one here. Yeah, I know. They make an even more controversial claim, one that provokes a blazing row, that the Pan Am plane had caused the accident by being on the runway when it shouldn't have been. They hadn't followed orders to turn off. OK, for sure. Maybe he counts these as three. Oh, oh I like this. They were, they were going to taxiway four. He was instructed to go on three, but he had to go four because taxiway number four was the one that had 45 degrees, and it was easy for the 747 to access it. And we said, confirm which taxiway you want to take. And he says, the third on your left, one, two, three, the third on your left. And we, and here again, I still believe this. I think he had seen us go by the first one. And when he says, count three more taxiways, the third, one, two, three, it, we were doing exactly what we thought he meant for us to do, and I still think that's what he meant for us to do. It was the logical taxiway to take. Whether they should have taken the third or fourth exit became largely irrelevant anyway, because it became clear that Captain Van Zanten had made one of the most elementary mistakes a pilot can make. He'd taken off without permission. We have 700 meters visibility here now. Wait a minute. We don't have ATC clearance. I know that. Go ahead, ask. Uh, KLM 4805 uh, is now ready for takeoff. Um, we're waiting for ATC clearance. KLM 4805, you're clear to the Papa Beacon. The KLM is given its ATC clearance, which is simply the route it must follow after takeoff. Now, it must wait for permission to take off. 325 Radial at Las Palmas VOR. Roger, sir, we're cleared to the Papa Beacon, uh, flight level 90. Uh, right turn out 040 until intercepting the 325. Um, we're, now... we're going. But why didn't his crew stop him? It's very difficult for a co pilot or a flight engineer to tell the captain, hey, look, you missed something. Tenerife exposed a problem that had long existed in commercial air travel. The pilot was regarded, and often regarded himself, as God. The captain is always right. He's never wrong. No junior officer was ever going to contradict the airline's top pilot, the man who'd given him his license. Pan Am 1736, report one way clear. To clear that. What do you say? Is it to clear the Pan Am? Oh, yes. Captain Van Zanten, highly stressed, knowing that he has to take off or abandon the flight. His crew, aware that he's done wrong, but frightened to tell him. Disaster is now inevitable. God damn. The official report is written by Spain. It blames the accident on Captain Van Zanten's decision to take off without permission. The Dutch refuse to accept it. They publish their own report, blaming language difficulties and the general confusion at Los Rodeos. What I learned from the Tenerife accident is that regardless of how well qualified, experienced, professional, and, and exact professional you are, okay, accidents, as long as human beings are involved, accidents can always take place. The insurers pay out a record sum $2 billion in today's money. As for the survivors, the images of the 27th of March will always be with them. They've just learned to live with them, 
That's all. And whenever I have friends that travel, I tell them, make sure you know where your exit is, make sure you read all that stuff, know how to get out of the airplane. I mean, those are important things. I never had nightmares. I had only dreams about being helpless and being at an airport behind a big thick window and watching an airplane take off and knowing that it was gonna crash and wanting to shout out, but there's this big thick glass window. You're just helpless and you, that's what you feel is this because our responsibility is to take care of everyone and that's what we want to do and we couldn't do it. We couldn't save them. The loss of my husband had a tremendous impact on, on my life, on my son's life, on my extended family's lives. It was huge. And you can see how f strange life is, you know, it, that things like that happen, that you get off and they go on and uh, perhaps if it's the plane left a minute later, it wouldn't have happened. I think it brought home to me how quickly you can leave this life and how everyone should uh, enjoy life every and each day as much as you possibly can. Well, after the crash, I decided to start a family. <laughs> I thought maybe I will stay home and have children. I thought, you know, my friends have died and if I let myself sit in this little apartment, it's gonna be as if I'm curled up and died and that's not fair to them. I can honor them best by living a life, a full life and not being afraid. I am blessed because I do not have any horror left over from the accident. I felt ashamed the first while. And a long, long time I, I thought, you know, I wish I died because I felt very bad. I was scared for quite a while after the crash, but I knew if I flew with Joan, she would pull me out again. I had to quit the NTSB. I, I didn't retire. I felt so bad that I became ill. I had to go to a doctor and, uh, and get some medication because I, I, I got sick. I went back to Tenerife, my wife and I, and I had a driver take me out to the airport and show me the runway. And uh, I looked at it all. I did it all over again. And then I went back and took the Golden Odyssey steamship from the Royal Cruise Line to uh, sort of complete the situation which I had missed. 